Welcome to this Medicine Masterclass in which we will be explaining how to perform a respiratory examination. Start by washing your hands, introducing your role, your name, confirming the patient's details, explaining the examination, gaining informed consent, offer a chaperone, ensure the patient is adequately exposed, position semi-recumbent at 45 degrees. Explain to the patient that you're going to make some general observations about the room. Look for any medical equipment, in particular for oxygen delivery devices. If so, comment on the nature of the device, whether it's a venturi mask, a non-rebreathing mask, nasal cannulae, and what the current flow of oxygen is being administered per minute. And assess any other types of respiratory support that the patient might be receiving, such as continuous positive airway pressure or bilevel positive airway pressure support. Nasal cannula used in non acute situations deliver 24 to 30% oxygen and tolerate a rate of 1 to 4 litres of oxygen per minute. The higher the rate, the increased likelihood of drying out the nasal mucosa and becoming uncomfortable for the patient. If higher flow rates or oxygen concentrations are required, a Hudson mask can be used which can deliver 30 to 40% oxygen um, at higher rates of up to 10 litres a minute. Venturi masks can deliver controlled amounts of oxygen and the device uses the Bernoulli principle and varies and mixes the environmental oxygen with the uh, delivered oxygen. A blue device can deliver 24%, a white 28%, yellow 35%, red 40%, and a green can deliver 60% oxygen. And these are often used for patients with COPD, where it's important not to over-oxygenate the patient. In higher acuity situations, a non-rebreather mask can be used, which can deliver 85 to 90% oxygen and tolerate a flow rate of up to 15 litres of oxygen per minute. In other situations, non-invasive ventilation, such as CPAP or BiPAP, may be required. CPAP, or continuous positive airway pressure, provides high pressure air and oxygen with a tightly fitting mask and is used to treat Type 1 respiratory failure can also be used in patients with uh, sleep apnea on a regular basis. BiPAP or bilevel positive airway pressure is used to treat type 2 respiratory failure in which there is uh, inadequate uh, oxygen and hypercapnia and this can be used in exacerbations of COPD and ARDS. <clears throat> Observe also for whether or not there's a sputum pot by the bedside and if so, examine the contents. The colour of the sputum can indicate, um, can provide an indication of the underlying pathology. Mucoid grey white viscous uh, sputum is associated with COPD and asthma patients. A serous clear water pink frothy sputum can be noted in patients with acute pulmonary edema or if in, um, in abundance can be associated with alveolar cell cancer. Purulent yellow green sputum is associated with infections such as pneumonia. Yellow sputum indicates live neutrophils whereas green indicates slight chronicity to the infection and dead and live neutrophils release a green pigment called verdoperoxidase changing the colour. Hemoptysis is a sinister finding and can indicate an underlying neoplasia or an advanced pneumonia or a pul pulmonary embolus. <clears throat> If there are worm-like structures or solid mucus, think about allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Now focus on the patient. From the end of the bed, are they coughing? Do they appear breathless or cyanose? Do they appear anemic? Are there any obvious scars? Observe for any signs of respiratory distress. Do they have nasal flaring, pursed lips? Are they using their accessory muscles, such as their sternocleidomastoid? Or are they using their intercostals? Is there any sign of recession? Or do they appear cachectic? <clears throat> Observe for any mobility aids, such as a, walk such as a wheelchair or walking aids or, or a, a Zimmer frame, which may indicate the patient's current mobility status, which will be important in managing the patient. If there are any vital sign charts or prescription charts, go through them in detail to determine what current level of management the patient is on. In general, once you've looked around the bed and observed the patient, you will examine the patient's hands, their pulse, the neck, the thorax, anteriorly, posteriorly, legs, and then you'll complete the examination. In the hands, assess for signs of clubbing. 
Clubbing is the uniform soft tissue swelling of the terminal phalanges of the digits, resulting in a loss of the normal angle between the nail and the nail bed, and usually indicates chronic conditions. In the context of a respiratory examination, chronic conditions such as interstitial lung disease, neoplasia, cystic fibrosis, chronic infections such as bronchiectasis, lung abscesses and asbestosis may result in clubbing. Other things to look for is the presence of tire staining. Cigarette smoking is a major risk factor in the development of COPD and lung cancer. Steroid induced changes. Patients with chronic respiratory conditions may require chronic courses of steroids and this can result in an iatrogenic Cushingoid features such as thin skin, bruising and this is something that you may see in the hands. Also look for any other conditions such as rheumatoid hands, this is where the patient may have uh, ulnar deviation, a symmetrical deforming arthropathy, and that can be associated with pleural effusions as well as pulmonary fibrosis. Observe to see whether the patient is peripherally cyanosed, and that may suggest that the patient is hypoxemic. Ask the patient to extend their hands and observe for whether or not there is asterixis. CO2 retention can result in asterixis. This is a negative uh, myoclonus seen as a flap. Tremor. They may have a fine tremor as a result of using beta agonists such as salbutamol. Assess the temperature of the hands. Cool hands may suggest a poor circulation and excessively warm and sweaty hands may be as a result of CO2 retention which causes peripheral vasodilatation. Examine the wrist by gently palpating the wrists, observing for any signs of tenderness. If so, this may suggest HPOA, hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, and this is where distal expansion of the lung bones results in painful swollen joints, and this can be uh, occur alone uh, as primary hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, but can also be uh, due to disease such as lung cancer. And if you perform a bone scan on such patients, you see parallel lines of activity along the cortex and the cortices of the shafts of the lung bones, such as the tibia, the femurs, the radii, uh, as well as the knees, ankles and wrists. Now move on to examine the patient's radial pulse. This is located at the radial side of the wrist and you can palpate this with the tip of your index and middle fingers. Determine the quality. A bounding pulse may be associated with carbon monoxide or dioxide retention. Pulsus paradoxus is where the pulse waveform decreases significantly during the inspiratory phase and this can be seen in severe asthma, severe COPD or cardiac tamponade. An irregular pulse such as atrial fibrillation may occur as a result of an infective exacerbation of COPD. While examining the pulse, also observe the respiratory rate and pattern. Normal respiratory rate is between 12 and 20. The patient may be tachypneic or bradypneic. Tachypnea can be physiological during anxiety or exercise, but can also be as a result of uh, chest infection, asthma, COPD, pleural effusions. Bradypnea, less than 12 breaths per minute, can be as a result of opiate toxicity, hypothyroidism, raised intracranial pressure or hypothalamic lesions. Other respiratory patterns and signs that you should be aware of are strider, which is a very uh, severe, potentially life-threatening condition where you'll have a harsh croaking inspiratory noise aggravated by coughing, suggesting an upper airway obstruction. Cosmol's respiration is a deep, sighing, hyperventilatory response, usually a response to metabolic acidosis as seen in advanced diabetic ketoacidosis, where the body is trying to remove through the respiratory system extra carbon dioxide to reverse the acidosis. Move on to request a systolic and diastolic blood pressure and then examine the head. <clears throat> Observe for a plethoric complexion. A congested red face appearance is associated with polycythemia as a result of carbon dioxide retention causing vasodilatation. Assessed by asking the patient to lower their lower eyelid conjunctival pallor, which may suggest anemia and that can exacerbate shortness of breath. Also observe the eyes carefully for Horner's syndrome. Horner's syndrome would uh, result in ptosis, meiosis, ipsilateral anhydrosis, and enophthalmos. So this is where the eyelid is droopy, the pupil is, um, is constricted, there's loss of sweating on the same side of the face and the eye appears sunken. And this can occur if the sympathetic trunk is damaged 
uh, or compressed by lung cancer, usually by an apical lung tumour, such as a pancos tumour. The other things to look for in the mouth are signs of central cyanosis. Blue discoloration of the skin and the mucous membranes occurs when the concentration of deoxyhemoglobin rises. <clears throat> in the mouth, look for signs of oral candidiasis. A fungal infection can be used if the patient is regularly taking a steroid inhaler or is immunosuppressed. Oral candidiasis is characterised by a pseudomembranous white sloth that can be easily scraped away to reveal the underlying normal erythematous mucosa. Microstomia, a small mouth, may suggest systemic sclerosis and that can be associated with fibrotic lung disease. From the head, move on to the neck. Examine the key structures. The trachea should be examined for any signs of deviation. The cricosternal distance should be determined. That's the distance between the cricoid cartilage and the suprasternal notch. If that decreases, it suggests that the chest is hyperexpanding. Examine the JVP. A raised JVP may be associated with pulmonary hypertension or fluid overload. And examine the neck for signs of lymph adenopathy. <clears throat> In order to examine the JVP, make sure the patient is semi-recumbent and comfortable. Ask them to turn their head slightly towards the left. Inspect the internal jugular vein, which runs between the medial um, end of the clavicle and the earlobe and is found between the heads of the sternocleidomastoid. And measure the peak of the waveform as a vertical distance from the sternal angle. And this should be less than three centimetres. <clears throat> Be aware that the JVP is a biphasic waveform with an A wave and a V wave and in the context of respiratory disease, if, there, if there's a raised JVP, you're thinking about core pulmonale, which is right heart failure as a consequence of chronic hypoxemia resulting in chronic pulmonary hypertension. If the JVP is raised and is non-pulsatile, then think about potential SVC obstruction caused by respiratory tumours. Move on to inspect the precordium. Inspect the precordium very carefully, looking for scars. Inspect anteriorly and posteriorly. In the first image, you can see a lateral thoracotomy scar, which usually is on the posterior uh, thorax, and you can f this is used for pneumonectomies or lobectomies. Anteriorly, there may be an anterior thoracotomy scar or a submammary scar. This can be used for both lung and cardiac surgery, for a lung biopsy, pericardial surgery, um, or, minimally, or in, minimally invasive or reduced invasive cardiac surgery. Look in the axillary for axillary thoracotomy scars. These are, it can be used for chest strain insertions and, uh, and, and check both sides. A clamshell incision as demonstrated here or a bilateral subpectoral scar can be used in a double lung transplant or a heart and lung transplant. If you see this in a young patient, along with a Hickman line, then consider, uh, the, consider the, the etiology of cystic fibrosis, necessitating a double lung transplant. Also examine for any tracheostomy scars. Any patient with serious respiratory condition may have required intensive care. And if they have a tracheostomy scar, also look for associated um, scars that you would find with a central line. In the corner of this slide, you can see a radiation tattoo, and this is an important finding to observe. This tattoo uh, is used to direct radiation rays when treating cancers. Other scars, you may see a triangulated scar, where you have three scars that triangulate, and this is seen uh, as a consequence of VATS procedure, or video-assisted thoroscopic surgery. And this is a type of thoroscopic surgery that's performed using a small video camera introduced into the patient's chest, and two additional uh, incisions are made uh, which allow it, the instruments to come in, and this can be used for a lobectomy to remove a lobe, apical pleurectomy, a wedge resection for a, for, to examine a nodule, decortication or a bolectomy, to help with lung volume reduction in the case of advanced COPD. The other things to inspect are whether or not the chest wall itself appears deformed. A barrel shaped chest can be seen in COPD where you have chronic hyperinflation. Pectus carinatum or pigeon chest is where you have a localized prominence of the sternum and the adjacent costal cartilage and indrawing of the ribs to form what we call Harrison sulci. Pectus excavatum, on the other hand, is a localised depression, and that's demonstrated here on this slide, with a depression of the lower end of, this, of the sternum, and you can appreciate that this would reduce the ventilatory capacity and can also cause displacement of the heart. 
look for any signs of skin changes, whether there's a skin uh, the radiation tattoo or any other signs of chronic radiotherapy. Posteriorly, inspect the thorax for any signs of kyphos scoliosis. Kyphosis is an exaggerated anterior curvature of the spine and scoliosis is an exaggerated lateral curvature of the spine and these can also affect the respiratory capacity. Now move on to palpate the thorax. We commented that the trachea should be palpated. The trachea can move or shift as a result of respiratory disease. A large pleural effusion or a tension pneumothorax can push the trachea away from the affected side, whereas a collapse or consolidation can pull the trachea towards the affected side. The thorax should be palpated. The apex beat can be reduced in a hyperinflated chest in a patient, for example, who has COPD. Occasionally, you may feel a right ventricular heave, and that would be seen in patients with core pulmonale, someone who has right heart failure secondary to chronic hypoxic lung diseases, such as interstitial lung disease. In pal in, while you're palpating the patient, assess for chest expansion, assess for symmetrical movements of the right and left chest, and that should be equal. Once you've palpated the chest, move on to percussion. The re regions that you need to percuss include the supraclavicular, infraclavicular, as well as the whole chest wall and the axillae. And, no and make a note of the percussion note that you elicit. Resonant is a normal finding. Dullness suggests an increase in tissue density, such as consolidation, fluid, tumor, or collapse. Stony dullness specifically relates to the presence of a pleural effusion. And hyperresonance occurs as a result of decreased tissue density, for example, a pneumothorax. Assess vocal resonance by asking the patient to say 99 as you move the stethoscope over various regions of the lung. Over normal lung, low pitch quality of speech are heard and high pitch components are attenuated. Now, if you have increased vocal resonance, i.e. you're able to hear the patient say the word 99 much more clearly than that suggests as consolidation. If that sound becomes muffled, it suggests that there's fluid or an effusion because sound finds it difficult to move through through fluid. Um, w apart from just saying 99, the patient can whisper, and this is known as whisper whispering pectriloquy, and the principles are the same. There's tactile vocal fremitus, where instead of auscultating for the 99, you can feel for the transmission of the sounds when the patient says 99, and you'll place your uh, medial parts of your hand over the chest wall, listening for, uh, for the transmission of the, the phrase 99. If there's increased vibration, that would suggest there's increased tissue density, for example, consolidation, tumor, collapse. And if there's decreased vibration over an area, that would suggest the presence of fluid or a, a pleural effusion. <clears throat> Move on to auscultation. Auscultate all areas of the lung in ensuring that the supraclavicular area where the apices of the lung are present are listened to and compare left to right. Vesicular is normal quality breath sounds. Bronchial breath sounds are harsh sounding similar to auscultating of the trachea. Inspiration and expiration are equal and there's a, a conventionally a pause between the sounds and this is associated with consolidation. Quiet breath sounds suggest reduced air entry into that region of the lung and that can be as a result of a pneumothorax or a pleural effusion. A wheeze is a continuous whistling sound produced in the airways during breathing. A polyphonic wheeze is associated with asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis, whereas a monophonic wheeze can be associated with a lung cancer. Coarse crackles, discontinuous, brief popping lung sounds are associated with pneumonia and bronchiectasis, and fine ended respiratory crepitations or crackles are classically associated with pulmonary fibrosis. Also be aware of agophony in auscultation. This is a bleating or a nasal sound heard over the upper level of a pleural effusion. You ask the patient to say E and listen uh, from the uh, bottom of the lung superiorly. When the E changes to an A, that suggests that there's a fluid air interface and that can help determine the extent of an effusion through auscultation. Once you've inspected and palpated, percussed and auscultated the thorax, move on to examine the lymph nodes. Ask the patient to sit forward and carefully palpate the various lymph nodes, the submental and submandibular, preauricular, posteriorcular, the superficial and deep cervical, the posterior cervical, the supraclavicular nodes, uh, as well as the axillary nodes. 
and any uh, lymphadenopathy may suggest underlying neoplasia. Once the patient's sitting forward, now examine the, the posterior thorax just as you did for the anterior thorax, starting with an inspection, the chest expansion, the percussion, the auscultation, and spend uh, a lot of time examining the posterior thorax as, the, as many signs may be there, including scars. To complete the examination, Examine the peripheries. In particular, look for signs of peripheral edema. Assess the calves for any signs of DVT and inspect the legs for any signs of erythema nodosum, which is associated with sarcoidosis. Suggest that you would want to perform further cl clinical examinations as well as checking the patient ox oxygen saturations and vital signs. Provide supplementary oxygen if required. Perform a peak flow assessment and request appropriate investigations and summarize to the examiner offering uh, an appropriate management plan. So in this masterclass, we've covered how to effectively introduce yourself, the features to look for on general inspection, both around the bed and uh, about the patient, the features to examine in the hands, face, the neck, including the JVP, the trachea and the cricosternal distance, the features to look for an examination on inspection of the anterior and posterior chest, particularly on inspection, palpation and percussion, as well as the important groups of lymph nodes that must be examined and how to complete the examination. Thank you for attending this Medicine Masterclass.